Good morning. This is uh, House and Senate Judiciary Committee meeting on H317, um, an act relating to establishing the racial the Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics and the Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics Advisory Panel. Um, there is a companion bill in the Senate, S108, um, but um, through agreement with Representative Grad and myself, we're dealing with the House bill, um, H317. Um, this all uh, has been going on for quite a while. Uh, one of the frustrations Every time we try to deal with something, as uh, no matter what it is, things in the criminal justice system, we lack statistics, we lack information, we we don't have that. The uh, Justice Oversight Committee and the racial uh, always get it wrong. Aton's group, he's the chair of that, um, but. They have done a lot of study. We've done a lot of study on what we should do. And this is actually um, presenting today a plan forward to have good statistics in Vermont that we can rely on to make good policy choices. When you're making policy choices without statistical information to back you up, you often make the wrong choice. <clears throat> and um, this will also help us in making sure that different agencies of state government follow, as well as local government follow what we present and be able to understand. So that's basically the, the impetus for the bill. I rep welcome uh, Representative Grad to make some comments before we hear from her. Well, thank you. I think Senator Sears um, really covered it all, and um, I really appreciate uh, Senate Judiciary joining us today, so we can can all start off on on the same page, um, as well as our witnesses. And uh, this is a very very important bill, very important concept, uh, really in terms of moving forward in our in our uh, criminal justice work. So, with that, should we turn it over to. Uh, Leg Legislative Council Eric Fitzpatrick to do a walkthrough. Does that work? Yeah, I did forget Sorry, to mention yeah. one thing, if you don't mind, Representative Red. Um, when the Justice Reinvestment Group from uh, the Council of State Governments Justice Center, we're in Vermont, trying to make um, recommendations regarding um, racial disparities in Vermont's criminal justice system, they were unable to. For, in a large way because of the lack of adequate statistics. And they're a, a data-driven organization that relies on statistics. And <clears throat> I think that was one of the uh, parts of the bill, um, or the, of the effort on justice reinvestment too, that wasn't as successful as it might otherwise have been because of our lack of statistics. Great, thank you. Eric. So, Eric, welcome. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Counsel here to uh, walk the committee through uh, H317. And as Senator Sears mentioned, there's a Senate companion bill as well, S108. Uh, both of them uh, identical, introduced in both bodies, but they're both entitled an act relating to establishing the Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics and the Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics Advisory Panel. So as you can tell from the title of, uh, of the bills, uh, essentially what's being done here is the creation of, of two different entities that are charged with uh, collecting and analyzing data uh, that's, uh, I'm gonna quote from the language of the bill now, related to systemic racial bias and disparities within the criminal and juvenile justice systems. So it creates, two different entities that are gonna be involved with that project, the two that, that uh, were just mentioned. And as a moment or two of background before we actually look at the language, it's I think helpful to know that, that this proposal is coming out of, uh, well, it started really with Act 148, the Justice Reinvestment Act, because it was in that act that you folks, the legislature charged um, the racial disparities in criminal and juvenile justice systems advisory panel with taking a look at this issue with, with a number of other parties involved also, of course, but uh, uh, analyzing the uh, racial disparities in the criminal justice systems 
issue, and out of that study came a report, and that and the RDAP report uh, to the Joint Justice Oversight Committee last year, toward the end of last year, and within that report is the recommendation for the creation of an independent pan, you know, independent entity to study this issue of racial bias in the criminal and juvenile justice systems, and that recommendation forms the basis of of the legislation you're looking at today. And that obviously there's a lot of details within that and, and very many of the details are also reflected in the bill for sure. But in the big picture, you know, it's that recommendation of the, of the establishment of an independent entity uh, to look at racial bias uh, in the criminal and juvenile justice systems that it came out of the, came out of RDAP's report to justice oversight that forms the basis of, of H317 and S, S108. So that's kind of a moment about where this all came from, um, and the entity that that the entities, I should say, that were uh, uh, as a concept recommended in the report are reflected in the Bureau of Just Racial Justice Statistics and the and the Bureau Advisory Panel that we're going to look at in just a moment. I also wanted to mention, though, that that um, conceptually, there's also some some history of of these sorts of panels and these sorts of bodies being established in Connecticut specifically. And that Connecticut model was mentioned in RDAP's report and was also uh, used as I was drafting it as a basis for where I was pulling language from and sort of the concepts of how this was all coming together. So I think it's helpful to know that as well. And I think, that, I think in fact, the Connecticut model, uh, and I'm sure the chair, Eitan, will talk more about this, but was specifically referred to in some detail in the RDAP report. And uh, obviously, that also was able to serve as a basis for the legislation, the bills that you're looking at now. Um, and, and the concept there, you'll see that's reflected that's both in Connecticut uh, and in the bill, is that you have these two different entities. You have one entity, uh, the Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics, that's really an IT entity. You know, these, these, those are. In IT professionals who are data analysts and collection professionals. And that entity really collects, organizes, assimilates the data on, on racial disparities. Um, whereas the other entity that uh, works with and oversees uh, the Bureau is the, is the advisory panel. And they're, they're more of a policy entity. So you kind of have a data collection, data analysis entity that's really um, crunching all these numbers. And you have a uh, another body that works with them, oversees them, advises them, and also connects to the legislature. You know, important that you have a sort of a voice with the legislature, uh, sort of analyzes that data that the Bureau is creating and can come up with recommendations for where the shortcomings are, where, the, where uh, improvements need to be made, what legislation might be needed, for example. And they, they can uh, connect with the legislature. And in fact, the the, the legislation we'll see requires them to report to the legislature every year. And uh, I think the, at least the concept there is that there will be sort of this, this, uh, you know, this ongoing communication uh, so that as the data is collected and analyzed, the recommendations can be made and can be sort of a, a circle of communication mm -hmm. between the legislature and the bodies that are working in that area. Um, so one last sort of background, comment as well before looking at the language, I also wanted to mention the fact that sort of where these entities are placed in statute is also something to sort of keep in mind because that was also an issue of discussion. You'll see that the way the, the, way the uh, bill is now, these entities are placed in the executive branch, specifically in the, in the agency of administration. Um, sort of where to house this is certainly a policy decision for you. I think that the two main uh, um, possibilities, not that there aren't others, but the two main possibilities that were being discussed so were sort of on the one hand, it could be a completely independent entity, right? Not housed in any existing uh, uh, government office, but could be completely independent, say like the Victims' Compensation Board, something like that. There's plenty of models out there for that as well. Or on the other hand, could be housed within an existing uh, uh, branch of government the way uh, the bill does. And there's you know, positives and negatives to both approaches. On the one hand, full independence, you have the sort of idea that there uh, wouldn't be any potential um, uh, impact or influence by existing uh, existing branches of government 
On the other hand, uh, you don't have really administrative structure in place to help out you know, with, the, with the way the committee's functions are meant to be. So it's really a discussion for the committees to have, and it's not that there's a wrong answer, but uh, the one, at least for purposes of getting the discussion started, was to um, put it in uh, the agency of administration, which, which makes some sense. And I'm just going to pull up one document here if I, if I, to let you guys see that also I think it's helpful for to look at the existing chapter where this goes in. I'm just going to make sure that I'm a co-host, which I am. Thank you very much uh, to whoever did that, Evan or Peggy. Um, and we're just going to see for a moment uh, chapter 68 of Title III, which is where this is proposed to go, which is where the Executive Director of Racial Equity and uh, the Racial Equity Advisory Panel uh, exist currently. So you'll see that uh, the, here it is right here. So this is chapter 68 of Title III, which is, you'll see it's the, uh, this entire chapter is called the Executive Director of Racial Equity, uh, but as well, the position is created, the, which um, is uh, works with, overseen by, advised by the Racial Equity Advisory Panel, and both of them are already there uh, in Chapter 68 of Title III. So it made some sense to, um, to add the Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics to this existing provision of law. And you'll see right there, if we turn to the bill for a moment, you'll see what that does is it just adds, it, it breaks up the existing chapter 68, adds a new, retitles the racial equity as subchapter one, and then adds a new subchapter two, which would be racial justice statistics. So there is some logical sense to having it there, but as I say, as a sort of policy resource matter, that's certainly open for the committees to discuss, but that that is the reasoning as to why, at least as to get the discussion started, the Bureau was housed. Um, in this location, you'll see. In fact, when we look at the language, that that the uh, language of the of the Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics Advisory Panel is modeled very closely to to the language that's uh, in this exi existing chapter on the Racial Equity Advisory Panel. Very similar. They so their roles are sort of similar in that they interact with with another body um, in a similar sort of way. Uh, so. Having said that, I could, I, since we have the uh, language up on the screen, I could start right in with the walkthrough, but I'm going to hold off, pause for a moment to see if the chairs uh, want to pause for questions before we start that or whether, I sh whether your, what your preference is for how to proceed next. Senator Sears? I was muted and I, um, I'm fine with going forward. I just wanted to mention Senator Benning is not here this morning. He's been delayed by a court hearing. Unfortunately, he, unfortunately or unfortunately, his job sometimes as a defense attorney requires him to leave. Great, thank you. Great, go ahead. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Senator Sears. All right. Um, so let's move right into the language then. So uh, I know the committee has a lot of witnesses scheduled to come up to us, so I'll try and move pretty briskly. But as always, I can't see uh, hands. So if anyone has a question, please please interrupt and stop me uh, anytime. Happy to happy to pause whenever it makes sense. So as I just mentioned, the the proposal is to establish um, the Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics and the advisory panel uh, in. Chapter 68 of Title III, where the Executive Director of Racial Equity is currently. This Bureau, as I also mentioned at the beginning, remember the Bureau is the uh, information technology arm uh, of this process. This is, the, this is the entity that collects, analyzes the data. So, um, and you'll see positions are created for that later on at the end of the bill. So the initial language states right off at the beginning that it creates this bureau within the uh, executive branch, as I mentioned, the agency of administration specifically, its uh, charge is in lines four and five, collect and analyze data related to systemic racial bias and disparities within the criminal and juvenile justice system. So its charge is laid out very clearly. The bureau is also uh, uh, told to work collaboratively with and have the assistance of, so other state agencies, all state and local agencies are instructed to work with the bureau for purposes of collecting this data. Um, and 
you'll see that in gr quite great detail here, the types of data, and that's what subjects and C is now going to deal with next. So now the Bureau is established. Now it's charged with collecting data. And so the obvious question is, well, what data? And so that's identified next. And this goes into quite a lot of detail. This, uh, these recommendations uh, uh, came out of the um, RDAPS report that I mentioned. The, the report went through the data that it, that, uh, it felt would be useful in quite a lot of detail. So that formed the basis for some of this. Uh, the data that's used in the Connecticut statute also went into the selection of this data. Again, it's, it's uh, an initial uh, take on it. So obviously changes, additions, subtractions, whatever the committee's uh, preferences are can be made. But for the starting, uh, starting the discussion, it's quite detailed and quite specific and it sort of goes through the entire juvenile and criminal justice processes, that's the attempt anyway, from the beginning to the end, collect all the data related to, and again, look at lines 10 and 11, the data related to systemic racial bias and disparities within, in this case, the juvenile justice system. So data related to that uh, in connection with, and just moving right through this list, uh, first one, it's demographic data involving offenders, parents or guardians of offenders. Remember, we're in the juvenile justice system, so that's why the parents or guardians pieces here are, are uh, in included attorneys, judges, GALs, DCF, law enforcement officers, witnesses, demographic data about all those actors in the system. Uh, number two, you start at the beginning, again, sort of the chronological process of, of the juvenile justice uh, uh, system. So the first sort of point in the on the chronology is the interaction between the offender and whoever they might be interacting with. So you see that's what this talks about. Encounters with law enforcement officers, DCF staff, mandatory reporters, school staff, school resource officers, any person who, you know, might be involved in that initial encounter, and that data would would uh, specifically uh, include information about where the encounter happened, the location, who with whom the encounter occurred, uh, whether that initial encounter resulted in release, citation, custodial arrest, uh, basis for initial arrest, the level and length of any detention prior to the court appearance any reports by mandated reporters, any data regarding particular schools encounters with justice involved youth as well. So remember that's pre-charge. Pre now you have, you move on to uh, any uh, post-charge diversion community justice program, pre and post, I should say. So this is really related to diversion community justice uh, systems and data about, about those programs, including referral rates uh, uh, and who, who it is, which entity made the referral, acceptance and rejection data, length of the program, completion failure rates, type location and outcomes for any risk assessment tools used. That was number three, by the way. So moving on to uh, further down the, the timeline of the proceeding, next you get to the delinquency petition. So it's a petition is filed, data on that, including initial and amended charges, challenges to the charges, premerits dispositions, you got data on defense counsel, including counsel's legal experience and the offender's access to an assignment of defense counsel during all stages. Uh, you got data regarding uh, detention and other custodial statuses. So you've got pretrial detention, release, discharge from custody, uh, any conditions of release, level, place, and duration of detentions, custody reviews, status changes, number of placement changes. Uh, so moving forward in the proceeding, you know, Pat, you know, we're now past the filing of the petition. Uh, what about plea agreement data? That also is here, including offers made, total numbers of agreements entered into, elements of final agreements, disposition data. So juvenile case disposition data, length of time until the final disposition, minimum, maximum sentences, location and level, fines, fees, restitution, probation terms and conditions, any other disposition alternatives. Uh, and lastly, um, data regarding any sanctions and disciplinary actions against juvenile justice system participants. So data about other actors it, within the system uh, to be available, made available. Eric, to, can I just yeah. break in there? On line five, page four, minimum and maximum sentences. Uh, do you, we don't have that in the juvenile system, do we? Yes, that's a good point. The uh, That might have been left over from the, uh, that was probably language that uh, inadvertently carried over from the adult system language below. So it should be, you're right, A, the length and time of the disposition should be there, uh, yeah. but it should be should be a reference to disp final dispositions. 
not sentences. Uh, the length of time in custody or those types of information. Yes. Thank you for that. I'm just noting that real quick here. But yeah, I think that probably was an inadvertent. Um, there also wouldn't be fines and fees with their, their, unless they're motor vehicle offenses. Right. The fines and fees. Yep. But there's a, I mean, I think I, that section probably needs some work to update for the juvenile justice system. Also yeah, curious that, about how, where do youthful offenders come in? Yes, I think you're absolutely right. That whole subdivision B there, I think was uh, just came over from the adult section. So that needs to be reworked. Thanks for catching that. Okay. Yep. So speaking of the, of the adult, uh, criminal justice system. That's what uh, you'll see next. Uh, the uh, language here will be very similar to what you just looked at. So it's really just very parallel on, in many cases, identical data regarding the adult criminal justice system and the racial bias and disparities within that system uh, that you just looked at with respect to the juvenile justice system. So again, pause me if I go too quickly, but since we just looked at most of this once, I won't, I won't hesitate too much as we go through, but again, the demographic data uh, regarding all the participants and parties within the system is present first. Data regarding pre-charge, you know, again, it's similar to the initial encounter that led to the charge with whomever it may be, custodial arrest, length of pre-arraignment detentions, uh, diversion and community justice program data, again, also mentioned in the juvenile sentence uh, context rather including cases eligible, number of cases referred, and acceptance and completion rates. Uh, charging data, uh, also similar circumstances around the charges, including initial and amended charges filed, challenges, pretrial dispositions, data about defense counsel, including counsel's legal experience and offenders access to an assignment of defense counsel. Again, uh, diversion and treatment program data, which we just looked at as well. Referral rates, who made the referral, acceptance and rejection data about that. Uh, this is all identical to what you just saw in the juvenile language, length and completion, failure rates, outcomes. Uh, Pre-trial detention and release, including conditions of release, bail amounts, defendants held without bail, bail reviews. This is all unique to the adult system, obviously. Uh, changes to pretrial detention status, conditions of release, revocation of bail, conditions of release, uh, plea agreement data, offers, agreements entered into, and, and the elements of final agreements, uh, data about, about sentencing, length of time until final sentences, uh, and, and this is actually, you'll see subdivision B, that's the language that we just saw that was inadvertently included in the juvenile uh, section. This is relevant to the adult section, not the juvenile one, which is minimum and maximum sentences, location and level of detentions, fines, fees, restitution, probation terms and conditions, other disposition alternatives. And lastly, um, uh, the same language you saw above about any sanctions and disciplinary actions that are uh, publicly available against juvenile justice system participants. Again, there's a typo. So that 10 should be in line, or line eight, there should be, there's a stray juvenile word, a word, you know. Um, so any, any uh, info about uh, sanctions and disciplinary actions would come in under paragraph 10. So we just went through all the data that needs to be collected, right? So then the next question is, all right, well, what happens to this data? And that's what is discussed next and requires the Bureau to analyze essentially all of this data um, and toward what ends to see a couple of different uh, uh, tasks that the committee is uh, instructed to do with respect to this data. First of all, identify the stages of the criminal and juvenile justice systems at which racial bias and disparities are most likely to occur. So again, through this data that it's collected, hopefully it will be able to identify where the disparities are most likely to happen. And also significantly organize and synthesize, synthesize the data in a cohesive and logical manner so that it can be presented and understood again. So these are information technology specialists who, are, who are, have been hired under the bill and charged with assimilating uh, all this data. But the idea here is to you know, be able to organize and present it in a way so that it can be understood 
uh, by by any other actor or reader who um, to whom it's presented. So, Madam Chair, end, sorry. If I if I could just interrupt quickly, um, Eric on uh, the Bureau Shall Subdivision One. It says develop right. a, a system to standardize the data collected. Um, does that mean they develop a system that will be um, pushed out to the various law enforcement agencies to use in collecting it? Or does that mean that they will create a system to standardize data given to them in various forms? In, in other words, wow. do, they, do they have the power to um, to develop a system that will be ad adopted statewide by the law enforcement agencies? I think they have the power to develop that system and in fact are instructed down below to develop a standardization system. As to how it's um, adopted, I'm just moving ahead here because there's a little bit that kind of addresses your question a bit, Senator Baruch. I don't think there's a requirement um, that other entities adopt their system, but you'll see in subdivision two and three that it is, it's put out there. They're, they're, you'll see in subdivision three, for example, there's a recommendation that, uh, that the uh, panel comes up with to recommend evidence-based practices and standards uh, for collection and retention. Um, subdivision two, proposing methods to permit sharing and communication between state and local agencies. So I think that the system of standardization uh, that's talked about above uh, is also uh, could potentially be part of what they recommend, but but no, uh, no, I think if I understood your question right, it's not a requirement. It wouldn't be sort of here's here's what other state agencies have to do. It's more of a recommendation that they that other entities could adopt. Okay, because I just wanted to flag that because that seems that's the the troublesome point. I I come at it um, also from. The agency of education and trying to standardize data around districts and it's it's participation in a standardized data plan that's the, the the failing statewide so it seems like one way or the other if we're going to ask for this sort of robust data collection it should be uniform from the get-go otherwise we're we're hamstringing ourselves it seems anyway Madam just Chair. wanted to put that out there Matt, may I yeah. comment on that? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so I think that from the law enforcement perspective that they're already starting to standardize how they co collect the data. Um, and most of the system, most of them are already using the um, same system now, the same reporting system. So I think that, that um, this goes hand in glove with with their attempts to already be standardizing the what they collect and how they report it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Not seeing any other hands and nobody's jumping in. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, Eric. Sure. Uh, so moving on from what what the uh, what the uh, bureau does with the data. You also see that the Bureau is required to maintain a public facing website. So this is a transparency subsection basically. So you have a uh, ability for the public to see what the Bureau has been doing. And they have, have a website, a dashboard that uh, specifically maximizes the Bureau's transparency and assures the ability of the public and historically impacted communities to review and understand the data. So again, the idea is the data is being collected and also it's uh, being made public so that there's uh, an ability of the public to see it and understand it. Uh, beyond that, there's some reporting requirements. You see that it's an annual annual reporting requirement. So on December 15th, uh, starting this year and every month thereafter, the Bureau has to report uh, to the panel. So we haven't gotten to the panel yet, but there's a requirement that the Bureau is going to remember the panel is sort of the, the, the policy, policy uh, charged arm of this, uh, this structure. And so the uh, Bureau collects the data and synthesizes it and provides its analysis and recommendations to the panel every year. And then as well, uh, January 15th of the, of the year after, 
the uh, Bureau reports that same data analysis recommendations to the uh, Judiciary Committees and the Government Operations Committees. And you'll see similar reporting requirements for the advisory panel as well, which I'll pause for a moment just to see if there's any questions before we talk about the panel. So uh, again, as I mentioned, the panel is the uh, more the policy oriented uh, body within this structure, uh, specifically uh, has the administrative, legal, and technical support of the agency administration, uh, has five members. And you'll see there that uh, actually, I'll just take a moment to look back at the racial equity advisory panels. I mentioned uh, the structure here is very, very similar uh, to the existing racial equity advisory panel, which works with uh, the uh, director, executive director of racial equity. And you'll see that, for example, A through E, the members, all this is exactly the same. The appointment of the members, who does, who makes the appointments, how they, um, how their terms are going to be staggered. All of that is just exactly the same as the existing practice for the racial uh, equity advisory panel under section 5002 of title three. So that is uh, repeated here again. So this is the the uh, Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics Advisory Panel. And that has same, similar, very similar five members, one appointed by the Committee on Committees, not a current legislature, one by the Speaker, one by the Chief Justice, one by the Governor, and one by the Human Rights Commission. Uh, identical language about the backgrounds of the, of the members that would be drawn from diverse backgrounds to represent the interest of communities communities of color and other historically disadvantaged communities throughout the state and have experience working to implement racial justice reform and to the extent possible represent geographically diverse areas of the state. Some uh, rather boilerplate language that you next see about the staggering of the terms, the idea is to make sure that since you know this panel is just getting started, uh, that they're going to be staggered at the beginning, they're going to be three-year terms except that uh, you know they're going to try and stagger them so that everybody doesn't expire at once, especially during the first year, but that's pretty standard language. I'm sure the committee has seen um, numerous times before. The, uh, the members of this panel elect by majority vote a chair, and um, the idea is to get them appointed on or before September this year so they can get ready uh, for when their terms begin in, in January. So moving on to the, the duties and responsibilities of the panel, you see that, uh, again, very similar to the uh, executive director of racial equity uh, relationship. So the panel here works with and assists the executive director of the Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics to implement the requirements that we just went through. In other words, all their data uh, compilation and reporting requirements, work with them on that. Advise the executive director to ensure ongoing compliance with these purposes. Now here's a, a crucial one though, this sort of, we're starting to get into the policy role of the, of the advisory panel. So their role is to evaluate that data and the analysis that they get from the Bureau and rake recommendations as a result of the evaluation. So there's this back and forth communications loop. They look at the data uh, and consider what other uh, steps need to be taken or any other recommendations uh, uh, as a result of the policy goals uh, of, of both bodies. And then uh, every year on, on or before January 15th, report to the committees on judiciary and government operations uh, with its findings. And you see there are subdivisions A and B, very important for what these reports have to contain. The findings regarding systemic racial bias and disparities within the criminal and juvenile justice systems based upon the data and the analysis that the, that the panel received from the Bureau. So they take that data from the Bureau, synthesize it, and on the basis of that, uh, they make recommendations. The panel uh, makes recommendations to the legislature. Uh, that's the sort of information loop that I was mentioning earlier. And as well, the report has to include a status report uh, you know, on progress made toward uh, this, the goal of addressing systemic racial bias in the system. So it's sort of got a combination of recommendations, status report, what have we done? You know, what needs to be done next? Um, they got your, peer, your standard per diem compensation for each member of the panel language. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you also have uh, specifically positions created within the Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics. And as you can see, these permanent positions uh, are all, uh, with the exception of the administrative assistant, there's one uh, 
administrative support position. But in addition to that one, the other three positions, including the executive director, they're all be, they're, they are all information technology data analysts. You have two uh, staff persons who are IT data analysts and the executive director as well. So this is a very much a, an IT, um, IT data operation, uh, as opposed to the panel, which these requirements are not in, in effect. Now, they don't have to be data analysts. The panel, panel are, has the broad, diverse background meant to be the policy arm uh, of, the, of the structure. Uh, there's an appropriation as well. I should the appropriation is based on numbers that I received from the Joint Fiscal Office as to the support needed for the for the four positions I just mentioned. Eric, can we go back to the executive director position? Um, that's the one in existing law, you mean? Uh, for, no, for, the one, line 15, that's the exec, that's the current. Yes, sorry, yep. The executive, the exempt executive director of the bureau should be an implement information technology data analyst. That's as, won't it be confusing as executive director of that in the executive director of the racial, um, uh, I've forgotten the, the title, Zana's title. I didn't quite follow the, sorry, Senator Sears. The, having two executive directors in the same department Oh, I see what you mean. Um, I think that I think that there's only this one though. I think they're all referring to the same person. Uh, I can clarify that it's confusing. The, the idea is that the so here's the executive director spot in the of the Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics. So that's the position that's being referred to, and the and the panel works with the executive director. Um, and the panel, I don't, I think, just has a chair, right? Yeah, so the panel has a chair, but there's only one executive director. Except Susanna is a. But Susanna's an executive director, and we're putting it under her. Uh, oh, I see what you mean. So, how many, you know, wouldn't be, I think it's confusing to refer to both as executive director. Right. Uh, yeah. Absolutely, can certainly clarify that. Uh, just to be clear, though, this position is not under. The existing executive director it's separate from just so people know that um, separate chapter within the same chapter of statute but this this position is under this panel not okay. this is under the Bureau of racial justice statistics advisory panel this is where this executive director resides um, totally separate from Susanna's position representative racialson had a question too. Thank you, Senator. So I, I think one way or the other, the titles of these two, um, people are going to get confused one way or the other, even though they're separate entities. And I think that it's strange that the only qualification that's listed for this executive director is that they be um, an analyst. Like, don't we want somebody who is committed to... so? So it does seem like the, the executive director has other duties besides being an analyst and I, that muddies the water. It also said that this position reports to the governor unless the governor uh, uh, delegates that responsibility to the, the commissioner or the secretary of administration. And it'd be good to talk about that too to just see if there are any nuances about that if it gets delegated. Um, and again, I think the role of what this executive director is going to do and ultimately what the qualifications and the name are, are going to need more discussion. Could I ask a question about that also? Uh, <clears throat> absolutely. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I just wondered if we had a discussion about whether this the this whole bureau should be under under uh, Susanna's um, position as part of uh, racial justice and instead of creating a whole new new office or new whatever 
Um, so I would like at some point to have that discussion. And then um, I'd also just question, and I'm not sure, Eric, if this is for you, but we have the Bureau analyzing and having a website that um, people have access to um, before the panel actually does any policy work around it and recommendations. And I, I, I would just like to have a discussion sometime about how those two things fit together because it seems that the analysts can put forward information, but it's the panel that's setting the policy and the recommendations. And if, if, if we need to do some um, adjustments there. So those are two issues I would like to discuss at some point. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Can uh, definitely flag those. Thank you so much. Let, let uh, me just, our process that I, that Representative Grad and I had planned would be for the House to take the first shot at this. So they may solve that problem before it gets okay. to us. Um, but certainly, uh, then it would come over to the Senate. And obviously, we would have to act on it. And I'm hoping that we can do it this year. Not wait. Right. Okay. Thank you. Great. Alice, can I ask a question? Absolutely. So I'm just wondering with regard to the um, school data and the juvenile data, I'm wondering, um, it's, it seems like things are very specific with regard to the demographic data. I'm not sure what the demographic data in this will include, but it, I, I don't see where um, it addresses confidentiality and in terms of small numbers from certain schools that are very small, how those schools won't be immediately put out in the limelight as having some situations that perhaps should be kept confidential. So I'm not sure how is that being addressed or can that, I'd like somebody to address that if it isn't somehow covered. So. I don't think it's specifically covered in the language center, Nitka, but certainly, absolutely, it's an issue that that you can can address. I'm I'm jotting these issues down as as um, as legislators uh, mention them. That uh, Representative Rachelson and Senator White and Senator Sears have mentioned these, and I'm jotting them down. So I'll jot that one down as well. Thanks. Yep. Uh, let's see, uh, Selena. I think I saw your hand. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say in a couple of recent bills um, that we passed where we had data collection requirements, we worked with um, Crime Victim Services Center and the Crime Research Group to come up with some language about sort of reporting up to the point of um, just ensuring protections for uh, victims' privacy in particular. And so maybe there's a basis there. I can point you to some of that language if it's helpful, Eric. Thank you, that'd be great. Hmm. So that actually is the end of the walkthrough. I could, um, should I pull the document down? I think I, I'd mentioned the appropriation. Um, the, uh, I can leave the document up or pull it down, whichever the preference is for the chairs. Yeah, the effective date, July 1, 2022. Um, I forgot why we did that. Yeah, I think it was uh, just a, as it often is, wondering whether everyone involved needs more time. But on the other hand, uh, maybe it really should be 2021, especially since you have the appropriation in there and the language we saw that indicated that the appointments needed to be made, or, were I, they, or at least the goal was to have that, them appointed sooner. The House, House can take that issue up as they work on it, but you know, might right. want to consider if we can get this bill done this year. You know. So noted. Uh, Coach, I see your hand. Sorry, get unmuted. Um, 
just thinking in terms of what uh, Representative uh, Colburn uh, had mentioned, uh, there is language, and uh, Senator Nitka, uh, there is language in both human services uh, and uh, education uh, for that disaggregated data uh, for small populations. Uh, because we, you know, we've got schools that, you know, uh, have very small numbers, mm -hmm. and when you identify uh, a poverty uh, student or a disabled uh, student or a BIPOC student, if they're the only family in the school, it's pretty obvious, you know, where the um, uh, the disparity is. Um, so there are provisions uh, in both uh, agencies uh, for how that data is treated. Um, so it would be worth uh, uh, maybe incorporating that with the other language that we used in the domestic violence related bills um, uh, as well. Just food for thought. Yes, I'm jotting that down too. Thank you, yeah. Representative Christie. Great, yeah, and thank you. Thank you, Eric, for keeping track. Yep. Appreciate it. Um, okay, I'm not, not seeing anybody else. Okay, great. Well, as always, Eric, thank you so much for your, your thorough walkthroughs and, and drafting. I know this was a heavy lift, big, big piece of drafting we asked you to do. So as always. Sure. Appreciate it. Happy to help. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yes, I should mention the last thing that I, I did mention this, the, the Bureau of uh, Racial Justice Statistics is in some ways drawn, I'm sure people have heard that the, the Department of Justice has a Bureau of Justice Statistics, BJS. So that's where I came up with the name. It just it seemed like it would be appropriate to similar entity, but targeted specifically toward racial justice statistics. So that's where that came from. Great. Well, thank you. Yep. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. If there aren't any other questions, and it works for you, Senator Sears. How about yes. if we, um, we go to um, Dr. Etan Nesren and Longo? Sounds great. And good morning and welcome. Good morning. Thank you, Representative. There um, you are. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> I'm here. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Okay. Great. Okay. Great. Um, for the record, I'm Dr. Eitan Ness Redden Longo, and I am the chair of the Racial Disparities um, Advisory Panel. And I'm here this morning to present their current thinking on this bill to you in hopes that it may be of use. Um, as you probably know, we meet once a month for two hours. Um, and so since this bill came into being, we've had literally six hours in which to discuss it. Um, and we've been working quite diligently, quite hard on this, the, talking about the location for this proposed bureau. Um, I would also say that this has not led to a clear conclusion and that may actually be of use to you because it would allow some flexibility in, in your thinking. And I'm hoping to contribute to that. Um, I have a summary here of some animating concerns behind the panel's discussion of the possible entities for housing this bureau. First of all of these was the issue of independence. Um, that was very, very much prime in the minds of the panel as a whole. Um, again, we didn't take a vote and so on for this, but I'm going back over our minutes from the last three meetings, and this was absolutely um, the first determinant um, in discussing vocations. Next was trust in the results that the Bureau comes up with. Um, a that would also, of course, allied with the notion of transparency. Um, that there needs to be competence in the work that the Bureau performs. 
Also, another issue that was raised by several panelists was sufficient authority to do the work. In other words, that the Bureau needs to be given the authority to request the data that it needs in order to perform this work. And that may sound immediately obvious, but it's not to some people who are very smart who are on the panel, um, that that needs to be made very, very clear. And then of course, another important factor is that there needs to be sufficient financial resources available to do the work. One of our panelists, Sheila Linton, who is the co-founder of the Root Social Justice Center in Brattleboro, said quite bluntly, I strongly support an independent body on this. We need to guarantee actual independence and the perception of independence. We need public trust. Again, that gets to what you've already put in the bill about the public facing website and such. Um, but this was really a very strong sentiment that many people on the panel had. Um, I prepared a slide, not a very elegant slide that I forwarded to Evan O'Connor. And I don't know whether you've all had a chance to look at it. It was simply outlining the eight possible locations that the RDAP has discussed. Um, I'll go through those. The first was, um, oh, there it is. Again, as I say, not extremely elegant, but there you have it. Um, the first was under the Executive Director of Racial Equity under Susanna Davis's office. Um, there were some pros and cons on this and some of them were in fact expressed by Director Davis herself. Um, secondly, under the Agency of Digital Services. Next, as a standalone body. Fourth, in the legislature's joint fiscal office. Next, the sec um, in the office of the Secretary of State. Sixth, the office of the Vermont State Auditor. Seven, the Human Rights Commission. And I believe there's been some discussion about that already. And then lastly, but not by any means least, the National Center for Restorative Justice, which is a more an academic um, entity that's housed in a variety of institutions, including UVM. We then had a bunch of discussion um, about all of these from the standpoint of pros and cons. James Pepper from the Office of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs weighed in. And he noted that for some, like a standalone body, the Joint Fiscal Office or the Human Rights Commission have the, they would have this body would have the benefit of a fair degree of independence from political pressure. Um, the task force that exists already obviously deals with similar topics. Others like the Agency of Digital Services, the State Auditor, Auditor or the Human Rights Commission have particular skills useful to the work of the Bureau that they already use in their routine business, like data collection and analysis, conducting investigations and audits, or investigating discrimination. Even with those, there could be an awkward fit between their core mission and the Bureau's mission. Some entities, like those under the direct control of an elected official, may experience political pressures that do not align with the Bureau's mission. Rebecca Turner, another panelist, um, and I believe she's speaking this morning, so I certainly don't want to take her thunder away, but she contributed very heavily to this conversation. She is a supervisor, supervising attorney in the appellate division of the Office of the Defender General. Um, she made the point that it doesn't necessarily make sense to put this body within the task force or under the executive director of racial equity, just because it's on a similar subject matter. Um, that similarity doesn't mean that the structure of that office is suited to this task. And that is partly, I believe if I remember correctly, because those, those offices report to elected officials and that compromises independence. Um, she believed that the uh, Secretary of State or the auditor would have independence from the governor 
and a certain responsiveness to the people of the state. Um, the auditor does investigations now and can support this type of effort. The Human Rights Commission obviously deals with similar issues and does investigations. During this last meeting, it was one of those wonderful moments when as a teacher, you have an arc and then one of your smart students throws in a curveball, and you want to hit them, but it's brilliant and absolutely to the point. And at that last meeting, that was Tyler Allen <laughs> from the Department of Children and Families. And he was wonderful. I was completely thrown, but it was marvelous. Um, he asked if the collection and analysis would be handled by the same entity or would they be separated? One should collect, the other should analyze. And the panel agreed broadly with Tyler's question, which was basically, should there be one entity or two, one for data collection and one for data analysis? Um, and that that should, it can and should be part of the discussion around choosing an entity or entities under which to house the proposed bureau. Um, another person who's interested in this work was sort of helpful in this to me, and that would be Christopher Loris of the Crime Research Group, who drew my attention to H265, an act relating to the Office of the Child Advocate. Um, in, I guess it's what, chapter 32, subsection 3202, which is specifically on the Office of the Child, Youth and Family Advocate, there is certain language at the end of that paragraph. I'll quote, while the office shall be embedded in and receive administrative support from the agency of administration, the office shall act independently of any state agency in the performance of its duties. I have not been able to bring this before the panel yet. Our meeting is a week from uh, last night, as a matter of fact, but um, I think um, that there'll be broad support for including some sort of language like this in H317, um, I think it would be helpful and prudent to put something like this in very explicitly. Um, a broader problem that needs to be addressed, and several of you have mentioned that already this morning, is that um, the data needed across all state systems of state government need to be analyzable, extractable, present, and open to public scrutiny. In short, what is proposed here ought to be a template for all of state government to assume that the criminal and juvenile justice systems are separate is perhaps uh, a bit, I don't know what I would call it, wrong? <laughs> uh, certainly short-sighted. Um, as we all know, racial disparity exists in many locations. Um, we see it in healthcare. The governor made some decisions about vaccinations based on that acknowledgement. We see it in education. Um, it would seem that this notion of standardization that came up very, very prominently in the report that the panel released is still of prime importance and needs to be considered and perhaps considered very broadly. Um, I'd like to wind everything up with just making a few notes on the issue of independence and why that is of such great importance here. And I want to do that by talking about the difference between civil rights and human rights. Civil rights, of course, are always considered to be the rights of citizens to political and social freedom and equality, whereas human rights are considered to be a right that is believed to belong justifiably to every person. Clearly, there's a blending and a blurring here. Voting is thought to be civil, but it also belongs, at least in this country, quote, justifiably to every person, unquote. But apparently, this isn't entirely true all of the time. We're now looking um, at a situation where, in Georgia, if you're poor and cannot easily travel, you will have problems voting given legislation that is currently pending. Another issue here would be water. Think of what happened in Flint, Michigan. At one point, the water was coming very nicely from the lake and now it's coming from the Dearborn River. And that isn't turning out very well for the children of that community. 
Racial matters are always thought to be civil rights. So our gender expression, rights around people around sexual orientation, and certainly around class. And one cannot argue human rights. They're inalienable, except that they're not. And we all know that they're not. We argue these all the time. Civil rights are always held to be in some political realm where debate happens, where disagreement happens, where the statement, people of good conscience can disagree functions. It's the cornerstone of the democracy, this notion of debate and disagreement. And there's a connection here that's obvious, I think, between the civil and the political, whereas the human is ideally believed to rest beyond the political, even though in practice, as I've just sort of mentioned, it doesn't always. I've always wondered as, a, as an individual, as a black person, as a Jewish person, as a queer person, why my rights were civil rights? Why weren't they human rights? I was always wondering why my rights were something people could argue about. They don't seem arguable to me. Um, that if we're talking about the pursuit of happiness, which is a, a phrase that has been enshrined for over 240 years in this country, I would say that's a human right. But it doesn't get considered that way. And there's a blurring here that I'm getting at between the civil and the human. Recently, transgender people went through this sort of change in political wind, and they did it quite dramatically. And it's not over and it's not over. There was a relative opening under the Obama administration and then a dramatic closing for service members around issues of rights under the last administration. And now I'm not sure we know, there does seem to be opening under the Biden administration, but history tells us that that should not reassure anyone for the long term. All it takes is an executive order. All it takes is an executive order. And the damages here mm -hmm. are obvious. Among veterans in 2019, transgender patients had a more than twofold greater hazard of suicide than, than, than their cisgender patient, compatriots did. More than twofold greater hazard. And one can legitimately ask how this politicization of rights plays into this fact. How does it play? How did it play? How does it continue to play into this horrible statistic? I would argue that it's rather difficult to pursue happiness if you're dead. That seems like a human right to me. It doesn't seem very civil. The fact of these questions just among this one historically stigmatized group demonstrates the need for independence in this proposed bureau. This is why it is of critical importance to the RDAP. We think of simple matters of legal inclusion within the body politic as being within the realm of civil rights. I suggest that they are not. I would further say that politicizing efforts at equality becomes unavoidably a human rights issue when the matter of simple well-being or existence is factored into the social calculus. Um, people of color cannot depend upon the direction of the political wind for relief. They simply cannot. And this is why the RDAP believes so strongly in this idea of independence and urges you to consider it with the same seriousness that we have used. Um, we ask you in closing to take these matters into account as you deliberate and debate and we ask you to think of the blurring of the civil and the human and the not necessarily monetary costs involved in this blurring. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you so much. And, and um, also thank you to your group for their very thoughtful um, analysis and, and feedback. And I look forward to us um, hearing from, from some of the members that are, are here today. Um, Senator Sears, how about if I turn it over to you? Because I know that you're- Well, I know, yeah, we're, we're gonna be leaving in about yeah. five minutes and hopefully, um, you know, and, um, and I'm glad that we got to hear um, the testimony. Uh, I would, uh, I don't have any questions, great one. Um, anybody on the 
Judiciary Committee that does, we're going to be leaving at 1015 and moving over to um, another bill for the Senate Judiciary Committee. The House Judiciary Committee will continue on testimony. I, I really thank Representative Grad, Eric, Eitan, for allowing us to join you this morning to hear the um, important information on this bill. We look forward to continuing to collaborate and work together. <clears throat> Whatever um, folks decide on where to put this, um, whether it's an independent uh, organization, um, the goal is to get adequate information um, for Vermont to be able to make good policy choices. Um, and to make sure that we can explain and to look at why certain things have happened in our past and uh, what, what we can do to um, solve those. And I, I was, you know, disappointed when the justice reinvestment effort went on and was unable to come up with data um, that would have informed us, I think, in a better way because the data didn't exist. So whichever way we do this, whether it's a standalone, um, however we do it, we need the information. Um, uh, got it. I think um, not having the information leads us to making wild speculation sometimes. So thank you all very much. And we'll see the Senate Judiciary Committee over on the other channel. Great. Absolutely. Great. Thank Whatever you. Whatever that might be. Thank you. Now. Thank you so much. Great. Thank bye you bye. so much, Senator. Bye bye. Cheers. Bye bye. Um, okay. So why don't we? We're about five minutes a, ahead, but um, why don't we take our break now and come back at?